everyone to this, this month's MedCan online seminar, Tired of Being Tired, Keys to Quality and Healthful Sleep. Thank you again for joining us. My name is Tanya Haas, and I'm the health and wellness writer here at MedCan. Now, before I introduce the presenters, there are a few housekeeping items to cover. This presentation is being recorded and will be made available at MedCan.com under MedCan Insights. Audio-only conferencing is available by telephone, and you can do that by dialing in on the number that you see on your screen, and this is also in your registration and reminder email. Regarding the audio, due to the volume of participants joining us, we will be muting all incoming audio to ensure clarity, which means we won't be able to hear you if you speak. That being said, if you do have questions throughout the presentation, you can uh, submit your questions here in the bottom left of your screen. Now you can see there's a little box there, it's circled here on the screen in red, and feel free to submit any questions you have throughout the presentation. Uh, they will be anonymous, we won't be, only the presenters will see who is submitting this, and um, it's a great way to um, get your interests and concerns addressed. That being said, it won't be possible to address all the questions in the time we have today. And finally, the information in this online seminar is for educational and information purpose only, and is neither intended nor to be, to be relied upon, nor to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, or legal advice. With all that being said, I have the great privilege to introduce our presenters today. Dr. Kaspari is a senior consultant here at MedCan, where he has served patients for over 25 years. He is a specialist in emergency medicine and internal medicine and has extensive experience in preventive health. He's also the director of MedCan's Physician Mentorship Program. Dr. Kaspari is a graduate of the University of Toronto Medical School and has also completed an engineering degree and an executive MBA. In addition to his responsibilities here at MedCan, Dr. Kaspari serves as Vice President Strategic Health Development at Monsanto Canada and he's an assistant professor at the University of Toronto. Dr. Alain Soto. Dr. Soto has been in medical practice since 1988 with a specialty and primary focus on occupational medicine, emergency medicine, and family practice. At MedCan, Dr. Soto is the director of the year-round care, which includes video visits. Outside of MedCan, Dr. Soto was on staff in family medicine at the William Osler Hospital in Brampton for over 25 years. Uh, he was also chief physician of the wellness division for Ontario Power Generation in Toronto and Pickering. And since 2006, Dr. Soto has been the occupational medical consultant for, for the Toronto Transit Commission. He is also a practicing investigative coroner. In addition to local and global speaking invitations, Dr. Soto has held a number of medical consults and positions for national organizations and on boards. Yes? <laughs> Thank you. So. I'm going, before I, I dive, we dive in, I'm going to give you the headlines for today's presentation. So we will be focusing today on sleep deprivation and its impact on your health, insomnia and how to manage it. Insomnia is known as the devil you know. We'll then go into solutions for better sleep, and then we'll focus on sleep apnea, which we're calling the devil you don't know. So we're going to give you a bit more insight onto that. And now, I, without further ado, Dr. Kaspari, over to you. Tanya, thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be here. Also, a pleasure to have Alain here with us, and he'll be adding lots of commentary and uh, review of our slides. Um, sleep deprivation seems to have a major impact on many of our patients, certainly the patients we see at MedCan. I think our next slide illustrates very well how the average 40-year-old is uh, suffering from sleep deprivation. So I've named him Bob. He's a 40-year-old male executive with a job requiring international travel. He has three kids, he has a home, and he has a cottage. And he is a masterful juggler. So how does he cope? One of the ways that he copes, he robs himself of sleep. So he starts off in his 30s, going to bed at midnight, getting up at 5 or 6 in the morning. He wants to get his fitness regimen in. That gradually drifts to 12.30 and eventually to 1 o'clock in the morning so he can get all his email accomplished before he gets back into the office the next day. However, Bob is not performing at his peak capacity. So it impacts many things. It impacts Bob's work as his pr productivity drops. He probably isn't aware of that, but he's certainly not as sharp as he once was. It impacts on Bob's family 
as he may be moody, depressed, and irritable with the sleep deprivation. It impacts on Bob's wife as he becomes disengaged and having difficulty coping with the fatigue. And it certainly impacts on Bob's health as exercise becomes a chore and he needs a high-carb diet to stay awake for the hours that he's uh, staying up. On the next slide, we emphasize the role of sleep. Most people think of the two pillars of health as exercise and nutrition. But really, fitness um, is one, nutrition is another, but it's a three-pillared stool, and sleep is that third pillar. Without good sleep, we really aren't functioning, and we're not reaching our maximum health. There's some very interesting statistics that uh, have recently been published by the Canadian Sleep Review, or in the Canadian Sleep Review of 2016. And I think uh, Alain may have some comments on this. So one of the first statistics that came out is 74% of Canadians sleep less than seven hours a night. The next statistic is that half of Canadians report that lack of sleep affects productivity at work. So people are noticing that they're suffering. So this isn't that they're suffering. They think generally people aren't performing as well as they might. The majority of Canadians, 60%, would like to nap um, in their workplace. They're feeling fatigued. They feel that that might remedy some of the fatigue that they're experiencing. And then a third field jet lag on Monday, and that's probably a combination of some sleep deprivation, alcohol, overeating, and the other activities of the weekend. Maybe I can turn to Alain at that point and ask him for his comments, whether he's experiencing uh, the same symptoms in his patients. Not only am I experiencing it in my patients and our patients, I'm experiencing it personally. So as, as a, uh, not only am I a, a consumer, but I'm also a, a sufferer of sleep deprivation. And in fact, um, I just saw a video called Sleepless in America by National Geographic, which is well done. And, and mostly it's US-based statistics, but 40% of Americans are sleep deprived. And 80% of obstructive sleep apnea, which we're gonna to get to later, are undiagnosed or not treated properly. So I think you know, the, the elephant in the room is, we, we always think sleep is an optional component. No, I don't think so. I think sleep is mandatory, mandatory without uh, compromise. And I think we take it for granted that sleep is just something that you, know, you have to do, but you don't have to need a lot of it. And you know, we're night owls and, and certainly in medical school and, and being an intern, I'm sure Dr. Kasparri remembers those days. We went off and sleep deprived. However, I think you know more more than 30% of people sleep less than six hours per night, which is counterintuitive. And we know that the recommended amount of sleep by all the experts, including the CDC and the National Sleep Laboratory, is seven, a minimum of seven hours and preferably nine hours per night. So uh, I'll turn it back to you, David. Great, thanks, Alan. And I want to focus on that, that sleep deprivation is very prevalent, and I think we have to set some parameters for what constitutes a reasonable amount of sleep that uh, people get. Um, in our next slide, um, we're going to set the parameter of six hours a night is really what we require. Um, beyond that, we have a decrease in productivity and decision making, uh, impaired memory and cognitive brain function, um, exaggerated emotions and mood, reduction in reaction time and motor skills, and that leads to a much higher risk of accidents uh, that can occur. Now, I think this is all reflected in an anatomical um, sketch of how it impacts the various areas in the brain. So there are five different areas in the brain on this slide. The parietal lobe, and that's responsible for math and logic. Lack of sleep leads to slower thought processes and difficulty with logic. The neocortex, uh, we have difficulty acquiring new information, new skills, and making novel connections when we're sleep deprived. The temporal lobe is involved with language, and when we're sleep deprived, we have difficulty with word finding and articulation. The prefrontal cortex is where judgment uh, occurs, and it's uh, really responsible for um, sort of the executive function. So um, we have slowed uh, visual recognition and motor reactions. 
So I think that covers it. The frontal lobe is the multitasking area where creative thinking is done, and certainly sleep deprivation impacts on that. So we want to look at solutions for better sleep. David, if I can interject there, there was a study that showed uh, two groups of patients, some that were sleep deprived and some that got adequate sleep, and they put a PET scan of their brain, and they found that the amygdala, which is the, the, in the cortex of the brain, in the, near the frontal cortex, was not functioning properly as far as blood flow in the sleep-deprived patient. So if you think it's just, well, it's, you know, superficial, it's, it's not, it's a soft sign. In fact, your brain tells you otherwise on PET scanning. And that's really important because it's, it's proven, not only mathematically, it's proven uh, anatomically. So I think, right. yeah, that, that's a huge uh, um, sort of evidence that we are lacking sleep. And I think to build on Alan's argument, there have been multiple studies testing people's reaction time and their ability to do these various cognitive functions that are required in an executive role. And those are all decreased with sleep deprivation. So it's one of those things, it's always in the room, that we don't know about and we don't talk about. Anyway, let's move on to sleep hygiene. <laughs> um, so solutions for better sleep, how do we get there? Um, I think there are some uh, fairly clear-cut things that we should think about, and most of us don't. Uh, one is to shut down electronic screens at least an hour before going to bed and probably two hours. And that includes, firstly, cell phones, because people are still picking up messages and email, shutting down their computers, and particularly shutting down the TV. It's been shown that the blue light that comes out of the screens that we use stimulates people and keeps them awake. So that needs to be shut down early. And doesn't allow melatonin release at a certain wavelength. Okay. So that's the other thing, yeah. So that blue light, because it's a certain wavelength of nanometers, won't allow the the uh, pineal gland to release uh, melatonin, which is the signal for the brain to, hey, go to sleep, melatonin's been released, and that wavelength uh, of light precludes the brain from releasing melatonin. So that's why light is really bad for you before you go to bed. It's good when you wake up, but yeah. it's terrible when you got to go to bed. And I, I think Alan makes a very good point, and that is that the pineal uh, gland is responsible for the diurnal sleep patterns that we have and we'll get into this a bit later, releases melatonin. So we need to be regular in terms of what we do. But we, if you shut that down with travel, you shut it down with blue light, um, it, it certainly makes it more difficult to get back on track. Again, caffeine, caffeine, nicotine, and alcohol before bedtime disrupt sleep. Alcohol, most people don't realize is disruptive to sleep. They think more of alcohol as relaxing and putting them to sleep. However, what alcohol does is it breaks down into constituent parts, something called acetaldehyde. So two hours after they have a drink, you've got acetaldehyde in your system. It stimulates the sympathetic nervous system, which arouses you and wakes you up. So you'll often hear stories from drinkers that they'll have a drink at 10 and 11 o'clock, will go to bed, and they're up at 2 o'clock in the morning, and they can't get back to sleep. Avoid stimulating activities within three hours of going to bed. At any rate, we should move on to, there, to the, our next slide, and that is um, develop a bedtime ritual to cue your pineal gland. So pick your time. It may be going to bed at 11 o'clock and getting up at 7 in the morning, and try and stick to that schedule on a fairly regular basis. So synchronize your sleep and manage your sleep. Couldn't agree more. So what, what is a good environment in which you might want to sleep? Um, darkness is important. Uh, coolness is important. So the temperature should be anywhere between 69 and 71 degrees. Warmer than that is too warm. Um, a lot of parents seem to be allowing kids and pets in the bedroom. I'm always kind of scandalized when that happens, and then they complain of disrupted sleep. Um, a partner who doesn't snore, if you can find one, would be a good <laughs> adjunct. <laughs> and if you can't sleep in 20 minutes of going to bed, I think it's time to get back out of bed and go and do another activity that distracts you, occupies you, and hopefully puts you to sleep. I think reading a book is a very good way to relax. And 
reading for 30 or 40 minutes before you want to go to sleep distracts you from all the day-to-day activities and the repetitive thinking that go on and tend to keep you awake when you're wanting to go to sleep. And just to add to David, on the coolness, I actually tell patients to take a warm bath before an hour before you go to bed. And as your body cools down from the warm bath, that's when the pineal gland sends the melatonin message to your brain. And that coolness says, hey, this guy's ready to go to bed. Okay. Mm-hmm. Does a hot tub get included in that? Yes. Okay, good. (laughs) So you'll recognize uh, in insomnia, and that's our our next slide and our next talk, uh, some of the cartoons which we have thrown up here uh, probably reflected some of your days in the office. Um, Sleeping at work, sleeping in front of the computer screen, reading through emails and realizing that you're not taking in what you're reading. Uh, watching a movie as soon as the lights go out, a lot of people will go to sleep. Look around the theater, the movie theater, <laughs> at the number of people sleeping in their seats. And I can't, uh, I can't exempt myself from that either. I tend to do that. Uh, driving, this is a dangerous one. A lot of people do tend to drowse off. And unfortunately, what happens is when they go to bed, that's when they get aroused. So that pattern needs to be reversed. I think our next picture is pretty representative of a lot of people in the work situation. Um, I want to divide insomnia into two different types of insomnia. One is the short-term insomnia. That's insomnia experienced for less than three months and long-term insomnia. That's uh, insomnia going on beyond that period of time. And flipping to the next slide, the short-term insomnia is probably precipitated more by stressful situations. Those can be job loss, illness, death in the family, and family stress. Um, I tend to treat those with medication because they're short term and the risk of addiction is fairly low. Um, The patient uh, would have had, or the client would have had a good sleep pattern in the past and now it's disrupted by a stressful situation. And uh, I want people not to feel guilty about the use of medications to help them through that period of time. Um, The second solution is for patients who have longer-term insomnia, and that's insomnia beyond the three months. Uh, What's come over the horizon fairly rapidly in the past two years is cognitive behavioral therapy. And it's proven more effective than medication in dealing with long-term insomnia. And I'd be interested in Alan's thoughts of the reasons that uh, people suffer from long-term insomnia and how uh, behavioral therapy can impact on that to improve their sleep situation. I, I think the in, in my sort of workplace uh, exposure as an occupational physician, there's you know an overabundance and maybe a pre-epidemic of mental health disorders. And those mental health disorders have usually one thing in common, sleep-related difficulties or insomnia or staying asleep or lack of sleep. And if you look at all the data, sleep is the common link among all mental health disorders. And that may be one of the reasons we're seeing a huge epidemic of mental health disorders in the workplace. You know, the, the, the numbers are staggering. We have a 35 to 40% STD and LTD long-term disability rate on mental health disorders, and part of it may be due to lack of sleep. And I think that we're under under sleeping, if you will, and that is contributing hugely to that epidemic. And in the workplace, it impacts employers, it impacts families, it impacts all the you know the workplace health and safety, uh, occupational health and safety. We know that people uh, who sleep less are more prone to accidents. And we see that in my occupation as a, as a physician in the transportation industry, uh, that they're more prone. And in fact, the, the studies show that there are tenfold increase in accidents due to lack of uh, sleep disorders or sleep disorder that's untreated. So I think you know, your points are, are well, well taken in that we need to do something to treat the long-term effects of sleep. And CBTI is one of those um, one of those uh, methods that is much better than just taking medications for the long term. I think CBI gets at the root of um, a lot of long-term insomnia. 
Uh, people go to bed, they have um, episodes of anxiety, they have uh, recurrent thoughts uh, that triggers off emotions, and all of these things limit their ability to go to sleep. Uh, those can also occur in the middle of the night and wake them from their sleep and prevent them from going back to sleep. Uh, CBT focuses on retraining the thinking pattern that you use, particularly when going to sleep, and how you can control the thoughts and emotions so that you are able to relax and go to sleep. And it's certainly uh, a better long-term solution to inducing quality sleep than medication. And 67% of the users of CBTI showed improvement. Right. 67%. Wow. Yeah. Which is probably a lot better than medication. Oh, yeah with less side effects. So in just a short term, uh, CBT leads to um, no pills, it's non-invasive, uh, fewer side effects, fewer adverse effects from medication, um, and the goal is to improve sleep habits, regulate the sleep-wake cycle, um, explore the maladaptive techniques and attitudes about sleep, and there certainly are those. And teach people the coping skills to manage their sleep. At any rate, I think we want to move on to sleep apnea, which is the devil you don't know, and I think as physicians, Helen and I see a lot of it, and it's not obvious when you see it. You have to tease it out and find it, but when you start to look for it, uh, it's amazing the incidence of um, sleep apnea, particularly in the older and the heavier population. So I thought a good place to start on sleep apnea is to explain physiologically what's happening. Uh, the first drawing on the left shows what an open normal airway looks like. It's easy to breathe in and because the various structures in the airway remain open, it's easy, easy to exhale. So there's notably no blockage to the nose and certainly people with nasal congestion or deviation of the nasal septum can have blockage. Uh, there's nothing pressing on the back of the nasopharynx, and that's that area above the mouth, so there's nothing that would obstruct flow. The tongue is small, so air can flow in and out of the lungs without any obstruction. Now, what happens in sleep apnea is a number of things that can cause it. Think of the, the, diagram, or the diagram on your left as being a one-way valve, and the di diagram on your right um, as showing obstruction to that one-way valve. So you can breathe air in, but you can't get it out because the airway is blocked. So the large and second tongue of somebody who's overweight can fall into the back of the throat and uh, restrict the exhaling air. Uh, likewise, a blocked nasal passage or a deviated nasal septum can do the same. And what most people don't realize is that the airways change as the body habitus changes. So if you put on 20% weight on your body, your airways are going to diminish by 20%, and they don't have the capacity to adjust to that. So they close when you exhale. So sleep apnea is really an issue where you can't get air out. Just to show you what it looks like when we record sleep apnea, we actually see that people stop breathing. So you can't blow air out, your oxygen levels drop, and your O2 levels start to go up. When they go up adequately, the oxygen drops to a critical level. It releases adrenaline from the sympathetic nervous system, and that adrenaline kicks in and starts you breathing again. Um, it can interestingly also lead to a sense of panic. People wake up gasping. Some people wake up and they will scream. A uh, patient who I had yesterday woke up in the middle of the night with inexplicable panic attacks that were probably induced by sleep apnea. And we look at both apnea, which is where people don't breathe, and hypopnea, which is where the breathing becomes reduced in volume. So they're struggling to move air in and out of the airway. So what are the indicators that Alan and I use to uh, assess the risk for people with um, with airway problems. Um, well, the first one is that usually the spouse will bring the patient in and say, you know, they snore loudly. What's wrong with them, Doc? So that starts a conversation. And when we look at the patient, we'll note often that somebody's overweight may have a neck size that's over 17 inches. So it looks as if their uh, neck is shortened and certainly widened. Uh, patients sometimes experience morning headaches. Uh, they feel unrefreshed when they get up in the morning. 
um, they may find that their blood pressure is starting to rise. And it's certainly when we see blood pressure rising and we see weight going up, the two are correlated. We start to look for sleep apnea. Ellen, your thoughts on that? Because I know you've got some very yeah. good uh, um, graphics here. As, as an occupational physician, as I said before, we used to screen train engineers driving trains um, for sleep apnea as a quick test. And you can do this at home. It's called the ANC formula, and I, I think we're coming to it later, but, but it's, uh, it's a measure of neck size in centimeters at four if you have a history of hypertension or taking medication for high blood pressure, and at three if you have a history of snoring, and at another three if you have a history of choking or gasping. And if that number is greater than uh, 43, uh, you have an intermediate probability for having sleep apnea, or if you have greater than 48 uh, in total uh, summation of that formula, then you have a high probability for sleep apnea, and that is the person that really should be going for a sleep study is at risk. Not only that, the definition of sleep apnea, according to the all the um, sleep studies, is, a lo is stopping breathing for more than 10 seconds at least 30 times an hour as classified as severe obstructive sleep apnea. And that if you think about it, what happens when you stop breathing is the same thing as if I was to choke David. Sorry, David, I'm not choking you, but if I was to <laughs> choke you you're, and you were sleeping, what would happen is, as you said before, your adrenaline, your stress hormones are going to go up, and that causes your blood pressure to go up, causes your heart rate to go up. Not only that, your adrenal glands, which is your flight or fright stress hormone release, releases cortisol. And cortisol, we know, also causes abdominal and central obesity, and that contributes to this prediabetes, diabetes, and metabolic syndrome, along with people who, for some reason, can't lose weight. They'll say, well, no matter what I eat, no matter what I do, I can't lose weight. Well, if you really dig deep, they may have undiagnosed sleep apnea because they're getting that cortisol blast 30 times an hour, and that contributes to the overall metabolic dysfunction. And I think, you know, this is a... I saw a patient yesterday at MedCan, name shall not be released, and he said he presented with, you know, memory issues. He was a young guy, 52, memory issues, and he had some erectile dysfunction, and he wasn't feeling great. He had some mild headaches, and then when I put it all together, I think he has sleep apnea. I looked inside his airway, measured his neck circumference, and there, there you are, and, you know, we're going to send him for a sleep study. So I think the quick test is the ANC formula, adjusted neck circumference, and it, what it does is it risk stratifies that person for going for a sleep study and increases the pretest likelihood that or probability that they have uh, undiagnosed sleep apnea. And we know that that has an increase in a whole bunch of the four Ds: depression, dementia, um, diabetes, and D is um, erectile dysfunction. So. Excellent. Uh, what do we look for as physicians? I think we've actually jumped one ahead of our, ourselves. Um, we're going to go back to high risk. Um, as physicians, what we look for is a family history of sleep apnea. There's a genetic linkage from generation to generation. And often when you think somebody has sleep apnea, you ask about brothers and sisters and parents, Eureka, there it is. And that increases the likelihood of the patient who you're seeing having it. Body mass index, that's the ratio of weight and height, should be less than 25 in a healthy individual. When it gets to 30, you're in the obese category. And so somebody with uh, a body mass index of 30 or more has a greater than 50% likelihood of having sleep apnea. Um, above the age of 50, the likelihood of sleep apnea goes up. As the waist size gets to 40 inches, the risk goes up and neck size at 17 inches. So all of these things alert us to the likelihood that it's there. Um, in terms of um, what are the impacts on the quality of life, I think that it's funny how most people attribute the things that they complain about to perhaps medical things that aren't pertinent. But I do a lot of sexual counseling at MedCan, and we see many patients with erectile dysfunction who believe that their testosterone levels are low. And I would say in 90% of those cases, it turns out to be a sleep disorder. Uh, they're not performing at work. Uh, they don't understand the criticism that they're getting. 
uh, this negative effect on relationships. And when you dig into it, you can often find there may be detachment, fatigue, and inability to engage. Um, you'll often hear the story of one spouse coming home in the evening, having dinner, the TV goes on, and that's it. The lights go out for that particular spouse. It's not particularly entertaining for their uh, better half. Um, hypertension, stroke, coronary artery disease, heart attacks, diabetes, and metabolic syndrome, as Alan has already said, are the medical impacts of where sleep apnea leads. So what are some initial steps in managing sleep apnea if you've got mild sleep apnea? Um, it can be managed without going to anything drastic. Uh, certainly one thing is sleeping on your side or stomach. Sleep apnea seems to be much worse on the back and particularly in the REM phase of sleep. A second is putting a tennis ball in a t-shirt and turning the t-shirt around so that when you roll onto your back, the tennis ball digs into the back and pushes you back onto your side. And obviously weight loss, easily said, but hard to do, but I would say that is the uh, key to a lot of sleep apnea. Um, here is the other option for you. And people seem to dread that when I bring it up to patients. This is the image that comes up over the table. That's the Darth Vader mask. It's not really that bad, and it's quite manageable. Um, there are a number of therapeutic devices that people are currently using. Um, I think to get to the point where you can think about it, you need a sleep study to clarify the level of sleep apnea you have. And there are many sleep labs in Toronto, an area where that um, assessment can be done. CPAP, continuous positive pressure airway in the airway, is the most common mask that we use. You can either use a full face mask or just a nasal mask, which goes over the nose and not the mouth. And uh, the machines are really quite small and extremely quiet today. Uh, the machines are humidified. Most people suffer uh, very little discomfort with it. It does take some adjustment time to get used to um, a CPAP mask, probably two to three weeks. What amazes me is that many patients say that after being with it for three or four months, they get a much improved quality of sleep using a CPAP mask, and they really can't live without it if they are part of from it with travel or you know other reasons. Uh, they really their quality of sleep. Uh, decreases uh, significantly. Um, there's an EPAP uh, method. If you'll remember the uh, di diagram that I showed you previously on the airway, it really is the ability to keep the airway open when you breathe out that limits sleep apnea. If you put pressure on the nose and keep the mouth closed, uh, you increase the pressure in the airway and that holds the airway open. And that's the gives you the ability to exhale air. And the EPAP uh, method will do that for you as much as the CPAP uh, method will do it for you. Um, a third way of doing it is with the dental device. And the dental device essentially mechanically holds the airway open by bringing the tongue forward. Um, a lot of patients will opt for a dental device because they find it's, it's a better option for them than going to a mask. Certainly from their partner's point of view, uh, it makes them look a little more attractive in bed. <laughs> um, so, Ellen, I'm wondering if you have any comments in regard to um, therapeutic devices and your patient experiences with that. I think once patients find out that the CPAP is not a big uh, Darth Vader box, they come back and will tell you after four weeks of using CPAP, their lives have completely changed and they are less headachy, their memories are better, their erections are better, they're much more awake, they don't feel tired, and now they have the energy to go and exercise, which is an added bonus to the, you know, the nutritional pillar and the, and the three pillars of, of healthy living. But I think of all the things I do in medicine, once I diagnose sleep apnea that wasn't diagnosed and treated properly, it is the most rewarding thing ever because patients come back and say, Dr. Soto, you changed my life. Thank you. So for me, it's, it's, it's a win-win. Right. But I think as physicians, we all expect a little resistance when we suggest that Absolutely. maybe they're sleep apnea and they need a sleep study done. Absolutely. So just to bring it together with our last slide, uh, what I'd encourage you to do is become a master of your own sleep. 
Uh, it's not a dark hole. It's measurable. You can measure the duration and quality of your sleep and keep a diary uh, to look back on sleep patterns that you're experiencing. Uh, the newest thing is apps for measuring that sleep. A lot of people have Fitbits, which really tell you how restless you are during the night. Um, I've looked at apps on the iPhone for sleep, and I think that SleepBot is the most interesting one that I've found, although there are probably six or seven available today. SleepBot will record uh, your motion and the noise that you make for the duration of the night, and you can record this day after day, bring it into your physician, show him what you're doing at night. So you don't have to do a sleep study in order to document that your sleep is not ideal. Uh, create those supportive sleep routines. Create an environment in your bedroom that really uh, supports the best quality of sleep. And talk to your doctor about it. He'll probably have some very good suggestions for you. So remember that sleep is important. It's as, as important as nutrition and fitness. And keep your focus on sleep, too. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Kaspari and Soto. Now, we do have a few questions, so we will get to those in just a moment. Um, if you haven't submitted any questions, you can do so now in the bottom left corner. I am, we are mindful of the time we have gone over, so thank you to everyone who has joined us, but please, we will have a, a Q&A session in just a moment. Again, no names will be used, and only the presenters will see who is submitting the question. Um, and we, you will be receiving a survey about the seminar experience. It is quite new to MedCan, and we do value your feedback. I'm going to take 30 seconds right now while the doctors review the questions to tell you more about sleep apnea diagnosis and CBT for insomnia here at MedCan. Okay. So um, um, MedCan offers two main solutions for long-term insomnia. Uh, MedCan psychologists are trained in cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia and offers this counseling in person and by video visit. This is a new service here at MedCan. Now, in terms of getting a, fir a firm sleep apnea diagnosis, as the doctors spoke about, it can be diagnosed at a sleep clinic or um, with at-home testing. Now, this, the reality is that spending a night at a sleep clinic can be an uncomfortable experience. In addition to providing referrals for sleep clinics, MedCan offers an at-home testing option, which uses a lightweight, portable monitoring device and this may be a good option for you if you're looking for a convenient, comfortable, and reliable diagnosis, and you may be prefer to do that at home as opposed to a laboratory setting. Or perhaps you live in a setting or a neighborhood where there's limited access to sleep clinics. So if you are interested in learning more about this at-home option, feel free to contact us at MedCan. You can visit MedCan.com or contact our sleep coordinator at the numbers provided on your screen. All right, so now we're going to turn to questions. Um, now, Dr. Preps, uh, Soto, I can speak to you first. Do you have any thoughts on the use of melatonin tablets at bedtime for short-term sleep problems? Yes, I, I, as a personal user of melatonin, I, I admit it, uh, I have used melatonin. The studies show out of MIT that if you use melatonin, even in small doses, for those individuals who are more than likely to get up in the middle of the night and are unable to fall back asleep, it is very helpful in that situation. So if you take even 3, 0.3 milligrams, there's no such thing as a 0.3 milligram tablet, but a 1 to 3 milligram tablet of melatonin prior to going to bed. And if you wake up, you're more likely to fall back asleep if you have melatonin on board. And, you know, melatonin is naturally made by your pineal gland, so it's not a foreign chemical to your body, so, and it's not addictive. And, you know, some people say they have great deep sleep with it, and some people have a few different dreams. So I, I would, you know, for me it works. For most people it works, and I find that it is called a jet lag drug for obvious reasons. Thank you so much, Dr. Soto. Our next question is regarding nutrition, and we had two questions on this. So what are some foods that you can eat before going to bed that won't interfere with my sleep but may still sat satiate my hunger? Um, yeah, and are there certain foods that you should avoid to ensure a better night's sleep? Maybe, Dr. Kaspar, you'd like to take this one? All right. Well, this is a very uh, interesting topic because I worked for many years as an emergency physician, and sleep was a very precious commodity at that time. Um, when you wake up at night at 2 o'clock in the morning, you can't get back to sleep. Carbohydrates are often helpful. 
Uh, calcium may be thought to be helpful in milk. Warm milk with honey is also very helpful. So I would say that will help induce a uh, return to sleep. Um, a carbohydrate, um, I wouldn't say carbohydrate loading, but sometimes carbohydrates uh, direct blood to the abdominal um, area and limit blood or reduce blood flow to the brain, which can be helpful in getting you to sleep. So you're talking about an apple or a sandwich, or I've also heard about people having magnesium um, from naturopathic you know, stores. Is that something? Yeah. Well, I think magnesium is also very helpful, as is melatonin in, in inducing sleep. Um, so as a sleep for sleep induction, magnesium is probably, I don't know, equally as effective yeah. as melatonin. And tryptophan. Yep. Okay. L-tryptophan, all natural products. Okay, so um, I have another question. Um, yeah, with regards to napping, is it okay to nap during the day? Is napping good for my health? And how does napping affect sleep and sleep requirements? Dr. Soto? Well, thanks for asking that question. NASA in the United States actually did a study on it. They found that brief naps improved performance by 34%, mm -hmm. which was, you know, news to a lot of people. And you know, a lot of companies now have nap rooms in, in, in their workplace. However, if you have a sleep problem, napping in the afternoon is not a good thing. So for those people who are sleep deprived, then napping is okay in, during the day, brief, short-term nap. You know, less than 18 minutes, if I remember correctly, 16 to 18 minutes, that is restorative, but more than that will affect your nighttime sleep. So I've, I've even heard of people taking power naps where they down an espresso, go to sleep for 20 minutes, and so by the time the caffeine has an impact, you're waking up. So there's lots of hacks out there. Like, Whatever works. Okay, I'm not sure I want to endorse that. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of information out there. So, yeah, this is what we're, we're trying to get the clarity. So, so nothing is okay, but under 20 minutes is, is that. Mm -hmm. Okay, ideal. Now we have another question regarding, you know, self-medication. So we spoke about short-term um, insomnia being treated by medication. Some people use antihistamines as a way to induce sleep. How would you, you know, what, what are your thoughts on that, Dr. Kaspari? Um, I would say that that's not a great way to induce sleep. Um, antihistamines have many other effects other than inducing sleep, and the newer antihistamines really do not induce sleep. It's the older antihistamines the Benadryl to do it, and uh, I certainly wouldn't use it for, for that. So if I can discourage you from uh, going the antihistamine route and stick with melatonin and magnesium and tryptophan. Okay, we'll have one last question, then we'll wrap up. Now, do your sleep patterns change as you age? We have a question from a concerned daughter here. Mother is in her 60s, and she gets up every morning at 3 a.m. without fail. Is that bad, and, and what can she do to help, help herself? she would be a perfect candidate for CBTI because the, the four pillars of CBTI are reduce your time in bed, which is, which if you think about it, it's counterintuitive. You reduce your time in bed if you're not sleeping. So uh, the other uh, pillar is getting up the same time every day and going to bed at the same regular time and getting out of bed after being awake for 20 minutes and doing something monotonous, as, as, as David said, and eliminating afternoon naps, because I gather that if she's getting up at three in the morning every night, she's probably taking an afternoon nap, and that limits her, her sleep patterns in the evening. Therefore, her circadian rhythm is going to be, which is your internal clock, is going to be off, and she may need to have CBTI for the long term. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Soto, Dr. Kaspari. This has been wonderful. Really appreciate it. This will be available at medcan.com within the week. Uh, thank you very much to everyone who tuned in, and I hope you have a great evening and a good sleep. Bye-bye.